Okay, thank you so much. I hope everyone can see me and, um, and hear me. Normally we serve mimosas at this hour, but since it's virtual, let's just do virtual mimosas, virtual cheers to everyone for joining the forum. So the topic of today's forum is audit, tax, and corporate implications of COVID-19. And we are very happy and thrilled to have uh, three industry experts who will be sharing their insights with us. So our first panelist is Monica Frank, who is an experienced senior manager at Ernst & Young. And Monica will be promoted to partner in less than two weeks on October 1st. Congratulations to Monica on this achievement. Monica is a strong professional in financial statements, reporting, gap reporting, internal controls, and many more. Monica is a proud graduate of the University of Miami Business School. And as I said, we are very happy to welcome and have Monica on the panel today. Our second panelist is David, David Carrion, who has been the Vice President of Ta Taxation at MassTag for the past 10 years. MassTag is a Fortune 500 company, infrastructure construction company located here, headquartered here, here in Coral Gables. In addition to MassTag, David has 18 years of combined experience working for Lennar and Deloitte. David is a proud graduate of both University of Miami Business School as well as School of Law. Last but not, la not least, our panelist is Sean, Sean Hoggard, who is the tax pr principal at Kaufman Rossin. Sean has more than 17 years of experience performing R&D credit analysis, audit defense, assisting companies in qualifying and capturing research credits. Sean is a proud graduate of Cal State. Even though deeply in heart, I think we are converting him toward being the king. And while in California, Sean developed a systematic project by project approach of qualifying activities that evolved into standard industry practices and an IRS methodology that we see today. So please join me in the virtual round of applause, welcoming, welcoming our panelists. And again, our discussion today will cover audit, tax and corporate reporting implications of COVID-19 during the COVID-19 period. We'll discuss uh, what, what we were doing prior to COVID-19, what happened during, how we adjusted to the, to the new environment, and what to expect going forward. Given that we have many participants who are students, our panelists will also share some insight, will give some practical advice on what skills are needed to be relevant and successful in the profession today, okay? I just want to remind everyone that around every 15 minutes, you will have CPE question popping, out, popping up on your screen. So don't forget to take it. And when we see that question, I will start for a couple of, I will stop for a couple of seconds for you to be able to answer the question, okay? So let's get started with our, with our panel and the first, as I mentioned, the first thing that I would like to review is just simply for historical context, since we all come from different backgrounds, different, we have different expertise and so on. Where, we, where were we prior to the COVID-19 on the tax, audit, and corporate side? So uh, Sean, Monica, and David, if you can, like all of you can say something on, on that front. Uh, sure. Yeah. You know, where were we? I tell you, um, we were still digesting the Tax Jobs Act from 2017. They got enacted in 2018. It was the most comprehensive and convoluted changes in tax law in 30 years. And it was put together in about two months. Or it was, it's been about two months in Congress. It was put together over six months. The last time anything of this size had come out, had taken over two years and was bipartisan. When the uh, current administration came in, it was pushed through very, very quickly. And we, uh, we inherited a lot of new acronyms, guilty, fitty, and all these things had tax implications. And so we were still digesting and applying 
code sections that we were still receiving guidance on up until COVID-19. And we were ticking along pretty well, pretty well. Everything was going along pretty good up, in that, up, in, up until that point. But we still were digesting a tremendous amount of information that really we hadn't had a chance to really have at least a year to digest and be able to apply properly. And so we were in a something of a, you know, a lag in between there and we were digesting it and putting it all together. So then COVID hit and that changed everything. Thank you. Monica, can you please say something on, on, the, on the audit front? Yeah, sure. Um, Pre-COVID, I think I was just a young student in Dr. K. Tatum's class. Um, <laughs> that was maybe a few years ago. But um, you know, pre-COVID, we were still in year-end busy season for 1231 calendar year-end audits. We were working through a period of tremendous accounting change with the adoption of new accounting standards, revenue recognition, leases, and then most of our clients were working to adopt on um, CECL, uh, the current expected credit law standard, which we really thought going into it that, well, this was going to be impactful, but largely impactful just for banking and financial institutions. Um, you know, still on site at our clients every single day and just working to get, get our jobs done. Really could not foresee the level of uncertainty that would come into the profession when COVID hit. Yeah. Yeah. And, and David? Can you please say something as well on the on the, on your side? How do you feel? Where were we prior to COVID nineteen? Help if I unmute. Sure. Uh, from a corporate perspective, we were at Mostec enjoying record earnings, record cash generation, record project backlog. You know the industries we worked in. They were in expansion mode. We, we do a lot of work in the energy field and communications. Everybody knows, you know, 5G is coming and we do a lot of work with fiber to the home and we do a lot of work in, in clean energy. All those industries were, were booming, you know, you know, from what Sean said, we were enjoying, you know, tax cuts and we were also enjoying reductions in permitting and regulations that had come along. And in other words, from a corporate operational standpoint, you know, we were booming from a, from a tax side to kind of echo some of the things Sean was saying, we were enjoying the reduced rates. We were trying to adjust our international tax structure to all the provisions that, that Sean laid out, you know, all of our financial statement audits, all of our state and local audits, those were things that were, were done in our office, typically on, on site. Um, we had the pleasure of, you know, going to conferences and training all across the country, fun places like New York, Washington, La Las Vegas. And, you know, usually when we had meetings, we were doing that in, in person. And, you know, we were full in swing with automating our, our tax process and other accounting processes at the, at the company. So, you know, as, as obvious to, to everybody, you know, everything was going great and, you know, now we have to deal with COVID as the, the new reality. Right, yeah. Unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, that's what we will find out today. So, uh, so what has changed due to COVID-19? And uh, Monica, uh, the, this question, I, I want to address this question first to you. Is the scope of the audit changed, for example? How do we do audits remotely now? What are the advantages, disadvantages of doing audits remotely now? Yeah, so the scope of our audits are, are different. Like the scope hasn't changed um, because the accounting or the audit standards haven't changed. We're still following um, either PCOB standards or AICPA standards or whatever the relevant standards are in the, juristic, the jurisdictions, but how we are executing them has significantly changed. We have gone from being on site, you know, every single day pre-COVID to um, doing it 100% remotely. We're serving some of the, at EY, we're serving some of the largest, you know, Fortune 100 companies where we could have had a team of 100 people on site every day year round. Um, you know, when some of our smaller clients, those audits may have, all, may have been done in or out of the office. But now we're trying to supervise, you know, our, new staff and senior auditors remotely entirely. So there's just a different level of interaction amongst the team and amongst the client. 
We're also working through a major digital transformation and we're trying to accelerate our, our digital transformation on the audit side. So while we would have traditionally performed very large sampling, hundreds of selections from time to time, we're really looking to use digital audit techniques. And I think with COVID, there's been a push to really transform that. So the scope is the same, we're just doing it differently. We're trying to you know, do it better and work smarter since everybody is a part. There's also some areas that are very challenging remotely, um, like in, for certain companies that have significant amounts of inventory, inventory observations, which is a very, you know, audit procedure that's performed in all companies with inventory, um, a little bit antiquated of a procedure since you're sampling sometimes 25 selections when there could be millions or billions of dollars of inventory. We're trying to use digital techniques or virtual techniques to conduct those. So a lot of transformation is what we're seeing. Um, things that are really outdated procedures or maybe a bit antiquated, I think we're looking to transform them in this digital environment or in this remote work from home environment. Also, you know, as we conduct our audits, we have to be very mindful of fraud and with our management inquiries and it actually puts a lot of strain on um, fraud. While I think all of our clients are honest, we do operate in an environment where we need to trust but verify. So. Right different level of verification and really looking for, you know, authenticity. There's a lot of, you know, things that are changing and evolving and specifically for me, since I primarily work in the technology industry, working with companies that are software or software companies, I think this, there's a lot of advantages with the disruptive technologies that are coming. Um, I do think there are some disadvantages with the interaction between our, our executives and audit executives and client executives. We're not walking the hall so sometimes there's a bit of a disconnect but we're trying to be smarter about how we can engage and the same with our people like we're not seeing them as frequently so there can be a little bit of isolation that anyone's feeling in any environment but you know as auditors um, we try to be creative and find ways to you know connect internally and externally right yeah it's 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 just amazing what 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 how we have to like all different things we have to come up with to to be able to trust but verify at the same time right when, when it comes to audits so david uh, oh we have uh, we have a question popping out up on the screen so if you don't mind answering that uh, right now um, so david what are the main corporate priorities during the COVID-19, I don't want to call it crisis, but period, period, right? I assume that now corporations are facing a lot of, a lot of changes, a lot of changes in the budgeting process and so on. So can you touch a little bit on that? Sure, you know, at, at Mostec, we had two main focuses, you know, a lot of little focuses, but two main focuses, you know, keep our employees working safely and find ways to manage our cash expenditures so that we didn't have to lay off employees or, or make any pay cuts. You know, we, we, we recognize that our, our, our people are, you know, our most important asset and we wanted to do everything we could to, to, to get to that goal. So, you know, we're fortunate in the industries that we work in that they're essential businesses, you know, working on people's internet and energy and providing electricity to people are, you know, important and essential. So our workers that were out doing construction on those projects were able to continue working. But our, our challenge was how do we keep our corporate office and our and our business offices, you know, working. We're we're a construction company and we weren't set up to, you know, have a full re working remote workforce. You know, everybody was capable of working remotely. But, you know, we our IT infrastructure just, you know, wasn't set up so that everybody in our offices could, could work remotely. So the first thing we had to do before we, you know, really got up and running on a remote basis was we had to boost our IT capabilities. So, you know, we had to make sure everybody could get on VPN and do all the work and access all the files that they needed to do before. We, we increased our, our cybersecurity because it's much easier to hack computers of a corporation when you're working remotely rather than being in an office on a secure network, you know, and then, you know, not surprisingly, we're sitting here on a 
a Zoom call, you know, one of the things we had to do is make sure everybody had that kind of capability, whether it was Zoom or we use a lot of Teams, but we use Zoom as well, you know, make sure people had that, you know, ability and get that on everybody's computer, everybody's phone to be able to, to do that. And, you know, what, what that did, you know, in addition to allowing people to work remotely is we, we found that really changed the way we, we did work. You know, everybody used to do conference calls all the time and, and everything else, but, you know, we weren't that uh, fluent, I would say, in sharing documents and collaborating together. We, we would use those kind of tools just to have a conference call. But now we learned that we could be so much more efficient by, by using this collaboration. You know, and, and, and I guess one of the unexpected benefits from Teams was we also found it was a tool to, to really manage our people better. You know, we, di we didn't see our people in person, but what we found is we were having a lot more meetings with people. You know, at first it was making sure people had things to do and making sure, you know, people were on task. But what we learned is, you know, having those meetings was a great way to find out did somebody need help did somebody you know need to be trained in something and or the reverse did somebody get all their assignments done and they needed new work so it was it was really a, a great benefit to us from an efficiency standpoint to to find this tool and i think that's something that you know even if we go back to you know a more normal office life that tool will will continue right um, you know, some of the, some of the other things, you know, we, like I said, we were focusing on, on cash management a lot. We, we definitely wanted to not have to lay people off. So that was a, a big focus for us from a business unit perspective. They were focusing on cash collections and in this challenging time, you know, all of our customers have cash challenges as well. So it's even harder than normal to, to make cash collections, but you know, our business units have done a tremendous job of that, you know, in, in this environment. And then, you know, on the flip side of, of collecting the cash, we were looking for every opportunity we could to, you know, eliminate or defer expenses. So what that meant from a, a tax department perspective was, you know, what, what kind of things could we get rid of? The first thing, you know, easy, obviously nobody's traveling, but, you know, Typically, we would travel to our subsidiaries all over the world, conferences and things, you know, that was eliminated for the, for the year. So that was a big savings. And then the bigger item, which, you know, I'm giving the tax department perspective, but it was a corporate perspective as well, is, you know, let's look at our professional fees and kind of do a new budget, you know, in March and say, hey, what, what projects can we eliminate this year, what can we defer maybe to the end of the year, to next year, and what projects that we might have used the tax advisor for can we maybe take in-house? And, you know, we did, we did a little of, of all of that. We, we do a lot of state tax returns at, at Mostec. You know, we're a large company, so we have over 500 returns that we typically do, and unfortunately, they all come due around the same time, so we usually use a lot of outside help in that. So that was one of the things that we took some of that in and, and we still allowed some of it to go out. And, you know, other projects like automation, you know, some of our automation projects, we found we needed to accelerate because they helped us through the, you know, COVID remote working situation, but others, you know, we needed to defer or cut to, you know, they were nice things to have, but they weren't a necessity in a year that we had, you know, cash constraints. Um, you know, more from the, the cash conservation side, you know, we looked at all different countries, federal government, income, sales and use tax. There was a number of guidance that came out that allowed companies to defer their payments from March, sometimes all the way out to, to right now, to September. So we were able to defer millions of dollars in, in payments and, and that helped the, the company a lot. Now the, the flip side of that is it also made our subsequent estimated payment calculations 
difficult because it basically changed our process where we would have had a, an extension payment made, Q1, Q2 payment, those were all missing. And now we're you know, looking at making a Q3 payment and trying to assess it in a different manner than we, we normally would. But you know, obviously a great benefit to the company to be able to push those payments out. Right. Um, you know, we also went to our state auditors and, and said, hey, you know, obviously we're in the middle of COVID. Is there a way to settle this case you know, for a lesser amount, or can we defer, you know, settle for this amount and delay the payment term? So, you know, those were also opportunities, you know, you say everything is not a crisis. Those were kind of opportunities that we took advantage of to, to go and try to settle a, an audit and, and help the company and, you know, also usually help the state because it got, you know, money into them when, when they're in need of, of money. Um, just maybe touch on a couple of CARES Act things that, the CARES Act was the COVID bill that came out in, in March that had a lot of tax provision. I know Sean's gonna go over a lot of that, so I'm just gonna touch on a, on a couple of, of items. You know, there was a deferred payroll tax withholding bill, which the, allows a company to defer the 6.2% uh, withholding on, on compensation. So you can imagine a company the size of Mostec, that's quite a big number. So we were able to defer whatever would have been due monthly from March to the end of the year to either the end of 2021, 50% and another 50% at the end of 2022. So again, another large number that's deferred, you know, almost two years out in, in some cases. And then, you know, there's also an employee retention credit, which the in, in intent was to help big companies continue paying employees that either aren't working or aren't working their normal tasks as much as they normally do. And it provides a, a credit of up to 5,000 per employee. You know, it's, it's, it's helpful. There, there are some issues with the, with the credit in that, you know, unlike some of the other provisions for small business that uh, I think Sean's going to talk about, you know, we're only getting 5,000 per employee, but it is, it is a help, but you know, some companies that aren't as fortunate to us and don't have as much of their business up and running, that may not be enough and they may be laying off employees, but we were fortunate that that was enough to, to help us, you know, keep our employees. You know, it's a, it's a very difficult credit to, to document and, and, and sustain, substantiate, but you know, it, it is a, a worthwhile credit. Okay, thank you, David. If you don't mind, I will stop you here since we have uh, a similar question to Sean and Monica uh, from Wayne Kellner asking about whether Sean and Monica help their clients to assist with the CARE Act and obtain PPP loans. Yes, uh, you know, let's back up for, for historical reasons, as you say, when we have such, you know, economic disaster ever since the Great Depression, you can't raise taxes. You flood the market with liquidity. The government comes in and basically opens up the gates. So as I was talking about the TCJA and the act that was really kind of pieced together very quickly, now we came up to the coronavirus, right? We're in March. So now the first thing we do as a government is we throw money at it. And generally what happens is you throw a little bit of money at it and see if it sticks. And then you throw a little bit more and to see what would happen, right? So early March, we had the Family First Coronavirus Act, right? That was the first one that came out. It wasn't another two weeks later that we had the CARES Act. And this was $2 trillion. This is a $2 trillion act. This is close to the entire 2019 federal spending budget. So everything, all the gates had been opened at this point. All of, the, all of the work we had done to digest most all of the changes from the NOLs to the limitations of the business uh, losses, all that all of a sudden just got wiped out. Now we can take back your, NO, your NOLs to prior years. And so the CARES Act, which was 880 pages, $2 trillion, and it was hastily put together. It was really hastily put together. However, the difference was, it absolutely flooded the markets with liquidity. The Paycheck Protection Program in and of itself 
probably saves, you know, arguably a lot of businesses. We'll see because that data is really not going to be uh, really fleshed out for some time to see how much it really helped. But the Paycheck Protection Program really was first initiated to help businesses in the retention of employees for two and a half months. So the government thought, okay, look, worst case scenario, maybe we're gonna be in this two and a half months, right? No, no one really knows how long we're going to be in this and, and how long it's going to take to get out. But I was very proud of our firm because we immediately were up very late at night digesting this 880 page CARES Act and particularly the Paycheck Protection Program to get money into our clients. And uh, David, I, I don't know if you guys were able to take advantage of it. I hope you did. If you didn't, then okay, you left some money on the table for someone who possibly needed it a little better, right? So that's where we were at. So now the floodgates had opened. We absolutely had to go back and re redo almost a lot of the tax work that we had done prior because everything had changed. We had had you know, bonus depreciation now that we could take on, on, on the real estate uh, improvements. And so clients and us, we were really scrambling to this day to be able to, you know, analyze and back out all of those changes that we were complaining about. And now we backed them out. And now we're sitting in a pretty good position tax wise. Companies are able to take back the NOLs. The uh, Paycheck Protection Program, which, look, if you don't get the, the biggest part was being able to get the, uh, the relief up. You would be able to get the, the, it just canceled, right? So if you retained your employees, but if you didn't, you just got a 4% loan and, the, and it was deferred interest, right? So if you're, not, if you're not able to get the forgiveness, you still got a, a really great deal. So I really do give credit to the fact that, listen, the, the CARES Act was put together, it was thrown together very hastily, but it did put $2 trillion you know, um, in, into the liquidity, into our markets that we're seeing right now that have helped us. And that has now kind of gone away, right? And everyone's talking about, to this day, what's going to happen now with the taxes? Is there going to be more relief? Is the unemployment going to be, you know, we're going to give out another $600 from the government, right? So right now we're sitting with a split Congress and they're still debating it. And personally, when we talk to some of our business owners, they are very, very split on the unemployment because is it driving people not to go back to work? Because they can sometimes make more on unemployment than they can going back to work. Now, I don't have the right answer for that one because I'm very fortunate. We're all very fortunate to be able to do what we do. And we don't, we're not the frontline, you know, in, people out there, the necessitated, uh, necessitated workers, if you will. So I don't know what the quite the, the answer of that's going to be. And Congress is going to have to answer that in the next few weeks to see where we're at with any more stimulus. Thank you, Sean. Monica, do you have anything to add to, to, the, to the comments? Or? Uh, we have the CP, uh, a CPE question popping up on the screen. So can you please uh, answer that question? Yes, yeah, so in regards to the question on um, the, the EY and how we help clients with PPP or the CARES Act, like myself personally, since I work in an audit practice, I'm more assisting clients with the accounting. Um, we do have tax professionals and advisory professionals that are working through all the different provisions, the ones that David discussed impacted MassTech, and as Sean discussed, that they're doing at their firm. So we definitely have seen all companies of all different sizes taking advantage um, of the CARES Act to answer that um, specific Q&A. There was another Q&A in regards to has EY or has have we put in audit standards regarding the impacts of COVID? Um, I'll talk a little bit about one of the things we're, we're doing. And, EY and working with the PCOB and also probably all the other registered firms have been, um, we've been doing kind of quick inspections that are much more collaborative with the PCOB for them to look at how have the firms responded to um, COVID-19 in regards to auditing and reviews. So they looked at um, 10 different review engagements from either Q1 or Q2 to see um, if additional literature and standards were required to be issued in regards to the impacts of this. 
um, at, at what EY is doing. We have our own um, kind of, you know, forms and templates, but it's much more of risk assessment. We're assessing what are the particular impacts on each client that we serve and do we need to do every, anything different? And based on just the initial reaction from the PCOB and other regulators, we don't believe at this point that new audit standards are going to be issued. We are working off um, really what are the risks and the impacts and then trying to respond to them um, you know, timely. And some of the risks are you know, significant, while others are not as um, as significant. And I can talk a little bit more about accounting and reporting considerations, but I want to pause and see if there's other questions. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we we have uh, yeah we have more questions about going concern and in general reporting. Uh, but if you don't mind me just uh, postponing these questions for a couple of minutes, and I want Sean to continue if he has anything else to add of what happened on the tax front due to COVID or what we expect to happen in the future due to COVID nineteen. Okay, you know you know as we said that. Before we were still digesting this big tax law, then we now have to basically, you know, undo everything that we've done on at the, at this point. So what's going to happen going forward, and what we're looking at right now is there could be a regime change in in November, and we're looking and clients and advising clients upon the candidates which ones you know particular tax impacts there could be. So now coupled with the issues that we're having now with just dealing with digesting and unwinding all of the tax law changes, considering you know, limitations, NOLs, now we're going to be looking very quickly and businesses are going to have to work very quickly to decide if there's going to be a regime change and individuals will have to decide if there's going to be a, a regime change here in before November, then that only gives you about two months. That's two months to do some tax planning if there's a regime change and what's going to happen. So, you know, it, the best thing that we can say is you got to embrace uncertainty because in our industry right now, in the tax industry, we have not seen these types of changes and the potential changes we may see here in the, next, in the future um, is, is unprecedented. Um, one of the things that affects businesses, and David brought it up. He, he does a lot of multi-state. And right now, the states are all hungry, right? And states right now have relaxed these nexus rules. The nexus rules meaning that a state has the ability to tax you. Well, because we have remote employees and everyone now is working remote. So therefore, if I have an employee in a state, I have nexus and that gives me responsibilities to file in that state. Right now we're seeing the federal government has never done anything with this they, because it, it doesn't, there's no federal dollars into it for the, for, the, for the feds. But now we're starting to see some remote workforce bills that you know they've been around for 10 years and they always get kicked out. We might see some things that are different. We might see some, some federal action. We've seen some re relaxation of, of the nexus laws with with states, or excuse me, with uh, companies who said, look, under the circumstances, if you have an employee in our state because of COVID, we are not going to, you know, make, force you and compel you into a tax filing. And, and that's good because as David knows, any, anywhere you have an employee, you have a physical presence and they want to tax you on it. So as a remote employee, if I'm in Toronto working, then does that give my firm Nexus in, you know, for, for Canada? That, and, and they are saying, no, right now, we don't have to worry about that. Yeah, okay. And since I have you on the screen, Sean, uh, what is your opinion? This question comes from Michelle Walters. What is your opinion on, on whether Treasury will make the PPP loan forgiveness non-tax taxable? Excuse me, just one second. Yeah, 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 please, yeah. Yeah, I apologize for, <laughs> for jumping to you again. Yeah. Okay, let's see if I can talk. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah. All right. What was the question again? I'm sorry. 
Tell me a question. Let's see. So uh, the question is, what is your opinion on whether Treasury mm -hmm. will make the PPP loan forgiveness non-taxable? So basically expense paid deductible. Well, at this point, it is forgivable as long as you had the retention, okay? To back up to it, we help clients and really to, to, to get the money it was really about a one page, one page, right? You do these calculations on how much my payroll was in this area for two and a half months plus utilities. You could be able to <clears throat> get the, the money to pay mortgages and uh, your interest, and then it's forgivable. Right. And so the government, you have until December 31st right now to complete that the loan forgiveness part. Now, the loan forgiveness part, I think we may need you because it, it's, it, it's about a level of a Ph.D. It is extremely difficult. And now there are some templates. We have templates and we created um, a template for the forgiveness part. But you have until December 31st. Now, the question is. Let's suppose I wasn't able to retain those employees. And now that, that number is not forgivable because I, I wasn't able to retain those employees, right? Now I have a loan. So will it be forgivable? That is unknown. At this point, you know, I, I, I don't, I can't look into the crystal ball, but as long as the economy, as long as COVID is around, we're, we're going to see more stimulus. And I think that's pretty much the, the case. I don't think we're gonna see, even if there's a regime change, you can't push through tax increases during these economic downturns. The Great Depression showed us that. Obama was able to do it a little bit, but he only raised it in the top 1%. We don't believe that there's going to be these wholesale you know, uh, tax increases if there's a regime change until the economy can withstand it. And then I do believe that there is a really good possibility that the paycheck protection loans will be 100% forgivable. And then that's gonna be a nightmare for Monica and her team to sort that out. <laughs> right. Uh, so, uh, okay, so the next question is from Mahesh and it's about, uh, it's about going concern. So I think Monica will be the one answering it. In regards to audits and reviews, has there been a closer look on going concern and, and subsequent events? And maybe in more generally, Monica, maybe you can discuss some accounting and reporting implications, considerations during the COVID-19 period, like fair value measures, the non-GAAP measures, and so on. Yeah, absolutely. So there's a number of accounting and reporting considerations and um, going concern and subsequent events is actually top at the list of things that are um, generally an issue or a matter. So um, a lot of companies are calendar year end companies or have their calendar year end as 1231. So we first you know, have to really assess as management's assessing is did these conditions exist at the balance sheet date? And that um, requires a significant amount of judgment as to what has occurred subsequent to the balance sheet date and is a subsequent event that's disclosure only or it does have an accounting implication. In regards to going concern, you know, management has the, um, it's management's responsibility to assess going concern for 12 months on the date that the financial statements are issued or being made available for issuance, depending on whether they're public or private. So if you're conducting an audit that's still not complete and it's May or June, it's the company's ability to continue as a going concern for 12 months past that date there has been a significant um, amount of work that has been done and effort has been gone into that area as there is um, quite a lot of judgments and estimates um, in that. Historically, on companies that were profitable, we hadn't, as auditors, maybe looked at that considerably and then even companies that operated, you know, with um, just earnings before EBITDA, positive EBITDA, we would say that that's, we're not giving it um, like significant significant amount of effort or that uh, it's what that we think that it's reasonably likely now even where we have companies that historically were profitable or historically had were um, cash flow positive or generated positive earnings um, from the EBITDA perspective there is more significant consideration being given to that and we are seeing you know a lot of our clients as discussed by you know David and even Sean that they're doing um, 13 week cash flows and they're doing giving their auditors a lot more support from a going concern perspective. 
We have seen um, um, an uptick in the number of opinions that are issued with either going concern paragraphs or other emphasis of a matter related to the risk and uncertainties related to COVID. Um, from a subsequent events disclosure, we have seen these disclosures becoming increasingly more robust and that there is um, lots of um, lots of disclosures in the subsequent event, what the company you know, would expect, and including risks related to their ability to operate with their workforce being remote. So that, um, that subsequent event and going concern is one of the top areas. So for people that work for, you know, for companies, you, know, you should expect that your aud auditors will be digging more into this. And for your students that are learning, like um, historically, maybe this hadn't been something that we really focused on, but now it is really a hot item. Um, I can talk a little bit more about um, some of the other accounting and reporting considerations. COVID does have broad um, impacts. It impacts asset impairment. It could impact your lease accounting. It can impact um, exit and disposal activities if companies are exiting line of business. It can have impacts in derivatives, impacts um, in debt modifications. It's very widespread. So I'm only going to spend a few moments um, kind of talking about what we're seeing as probably the top five impacts. And I did already touch a little bit upon um, going concern in liquidity. So we are seeing um, even companies that um, are still doing well having some impacts in regards to um, asset impairment. And generally, as companies are assessing um, for indicators of impairment, COVID is going to be an indicator for every company. There's going to be some level of impact. As companies assess, you know, asset impairment, like the order in which impairment, you know, um, um, like quantitative or qualitative, qualitative tests are conducted is also important, right? You start with indefinite lived assets, then your long lived assets, and then you're assessing goodwill at the reporting unit level. So some of the finer points in this accounting literature that maybe hadn't been focused on, like what are your asset groups, what's your reporting um, unit, are, coming, are becoming more and more of a challenge. Um, in regards to asset impairment, there's companies that have very large right of use assets for all their physical locations, all their buildings, all their properties, and maybe at this point in time, they have actually had a CCU state for some of those locations. So just many, many things um, in regards to this environment where it's affecting asset impairment. Even some of um, what we've seen is even companies that haven't had a major impact on, on their, with, where COVID has not had a major impact on their operations, there's been some level of impairment um, in regards to operating assets. In general, just with accounting estimates, um, our clients are finding it increasingly hard because of the uncertainties related to COVID and also the availability of information. Um, you know, while we're all working in this work from home environment and there isn't as much connectivity, sometimes there is a little bit of a slowdown in the availability of information or our clients are waiting to get information from third party service providers and they're also having um, some operational disruption. So just every accounting estimate is being you know, challenged and really looking, um, is that really the right estimate based on where we are in the COVID environment? Um, we talk, I, talk, I mentioned um, CECL, which is the credit, the current expected credit law standard. I think, you know, before COVID, we really thought this was not going to be as impactful as it relates to account receivable and short-term financial assets. But what we've seen in the last six months is most of our clients have had to you know, really reconsider how they adopted that standard and um, record additional um, current losses. Because where you, you know, historically might have thought all your accounts receivable were collectible, you may have customers um, or clients that are more impacted than you, maybe because of the jurisdictions that they operate or various different criteria. So we're seeing quite a bit of acceleration and just higher reserves being recorded under that new model. Um, which went into effect for public companies, but there is some relief for private. So we expect that to be more impactful. Um, we're seeing in the environment, every company is affected by some level of contract modification, whether it's contract modifications with their contracts with customers or their leases, um, their operating leases or debt modification. And we are seeing um, you know, troubled debt restructurings or also just um, companies trying to take this opportunity to um, just really revisit their debt arrangements. 
So there's some level of accounting related to all of those types of contract modifications. Disclosure impact and non-GAAP measures is also something that, you know, for companies that are SEC registrants and public companies, it's not only their disclosures in their footnotes, but it's updating um, risk assessment, updating MDNA, and then also considering um, non-GAAP. And, you know, the SEC did come out with a lot of publications and clarification on what you can change from a non-GAAP measure. We are seeing just like as an evolution um, in the accounting and kind of financial services world, a heavy reliance on non-GAAP. And, you know, on a positive note, as we're starting to see like a lot of IPO activity, like this week alone, I think was the largest IPO activity like in the history of capital markets with um, Snowflake and I think Unit, Unity closing today and a couple others. Um, we're seeing a heavy reliance on non-GAAP measures. Um, those are what is indicating the value of the business. So just as companies are working through the impacts of COVID, it's very important to really consider what changes that they've made from a non-GAAP perspective. And this is something the SEC is looking at closely. Um, the SEC is encouraging companies that are public, obviously, to over-disclose to provide investors real-time information of how this is continuing to impact you know, their operations over the course of the year. Um, I'm going to pause yeah. for a second to see if there's any so, questions. So, so, yes, I apologize for interrupting. Since you're talking about this, I'm thinking it, it, it's just a pain to analyze this from the investor's perspective. Like being a, let's say, call it retail investor and trying to digest everything that is happening inside the company and how they report about it and then trade on this information and let's say remain not at loss or, <laughs> you know, as, a, as an investor. Like what, what sources do we have to look at? And you are saying that check risk factors, check MDNA, listen to conference calls and so on, right? To, to better understand these non-GAAP metrics and so on, what has been adjusted, what, ha what, what hasn't been, yeah. And, and we're, we're in my office, we're in Miami. I know people are remote, but our economy, you know, is run by travel and tourism. We have, you know, the three largest cruise lines operating in our backyard. So we do see a lot of some of the implications and where companies have really had to cease operations and delay lots of different things. And there's um, a lot of direct impacts in that industry. And, you know, the travel and tourism um, from a hotel perspective and food and beverage. So we have seen um, more impacts here than maybe the broader U.S. But we do also have, you know, in Florida and in South Florida, some companies that are still doing well. We have some large tech companies, you know, that are thriving. So we're seeing both sides of it from an accounting um, perspective. And then one of the other huge accounting and reporting impacts is accounting for everything Sean and David um, discussed. Because a lot of times, the way I think of the difference between like tax and audit, it's tax is much more focused on cash flow and the amount of tax that you're gonna pay, but audit and accounting is you know, how do we account for these transactions? And sometimes, you know, the accounting may be very different than the actual flow of the cash. So um, that is probably the fifth largest impact um, in regards to what, what are we seeing from a, from a professional environment. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Monica, for sharing these insights with us. And we have a CPE question on the screen, so take a couple of seconds to answer it and we'll continue with our discussion. Okay, so, um, so we discussed that we do, do most of our work remotely now, right? And the, this question is to all panelists. Do you foresee that things will ever go back to normal or, or will have a new normal? What things do you think will have to go back to in-person interactions and what things will, can remain in the remote fashion? So David, if you don't mind uh, starting on this question. Sure. Uh, you know, I, I don't think everything will go back to how it was. I think a lot of things will return to, to you know, normal face-to-face -face interaction. But I think what we've learned is we know we could do a lot more than we thought we could, you know, remotely. I still think there's certain things 
that happen better in a face-to-face, -face, you know, in, encounter. A lot of times just by being in the office, I run into somebody and we exchange information. Whereas today, if you're not scheduling a call or, or a, you know, a conference call or a team's call or something to that matter, you may not be talking with everybody you would see in an office and, and getting information. So I think those types of things, you just can't help but be better in the office. But like I said, I think we learned a lot about the amount of work we can do remotely and how many people can really be remotely. And like I said, a lot of those things I mentioned, you know, that we learned on Teams, we, we learned a lot of useful tools that even if a lot of people return to the office, we would still use those tools to manage our, our people, to share documents, to, to do collaborative reviews of documents. You know, I, I think those things will will continue. You know, the, the other thing I think is difficult and, you know, this is probably more difficult in, uh, you know, uh, the accounting firms than in industry, but it's difficult in industry as well. When you have a new person, I think that's a harder environment to start on a remote basis. You know, when we went remote, we went remote with people that have been doing, you know, their task and they know what they need to do. They know who they need to call. They, you know, they know who to contact. When you have somebody new that needs to learn all those things, it's not that they can't. I think it's just a longer, you know, startup period to get them trained. You might, you might even see, even with re remote working, you might see, you know, people have to come into the office for, you know, I don't know, a training kind of, I won't call it probation, but more of a, a training mission so that they know what's going on with the company, know who people are and, and things like that. Okay, thank you. Uh, and Sean, what, what's your perspective on that? What will you continue doing remotely and what things will have to go back to in person? Right, you know, that's, that's a great question. And I think our entire industry is right now dealing with that is what is the new norm how many people are not going to be comfortable coming back into an office environment where we have something of a bullpen area where we have you know staff literally shoulder to shoulder so we're going to have to invest in some plexiglass to begin with right and yeah. so if we can find the plexiglass so those are one of the winners that we talk about so there's a saying where there's disaster opportunity arises and we, we do, we see a tremendous amount of opportunity for, for us to expand services and to do a lot of things that we weren't able to do before. For instance, even though we're working remotely, we never, we, or excuse me, before we were working remotely, it's like, okay, who used Zoom? I mean, we didn't, we, we, we were barely using Teams the way we use Teams now, right? It's a Microsoft product. Now everybody, everybody's using Zoom. So clients have become more adept and it's easier for them to contact us. And we can say, look, let's have a meeting. Let's get there so we can at least see each other. Now we're not gonna give high five and hugs anymore, but at least we've got that visual. I'm very fortunate to work for Prof and Rossens because look, we were in South Florida. So we had to be able to work remotely. Irma actually had taken out some of our servers that were on the bottom floor. We thought everything was great, but come, come to find out there was one critical server that didn't get moved up to the cloud. And of course, when Irma hit, it flooded us. So we then took action so that would never happen again. So we were able to very quickly, very quickly move to a remote setting. So because everything is cloud-based. So the problem and the challenges with, with that is is that interaction, that spontaneity. I do miss people. I, I, I do miss being able to sit next to the staff and be able to talk to them and be able to train them. And there's something intimate about that that, that makes a bonding that we can't, we will never be able to do that over the screen, right? You just, it's like trying to give you a haircut over the phone. It won't work, right? So that's a balance. And right now we're, we're, we're trying to, stay in touch with our new staff and bring them on board. And you know what, we're, we're planning on hiring again. I mean, we, we, and, and that will be our next challenge is how do we absolutely truly onboard the next group without any type of interaction where you can't sit next to them. You're gonna have to do a screen share. 
you're going to have to teach them, you know, how, how to work in this type of environment where they were thinking they're going to come to an office. So we don't know when this is going to end, right? And, and if, we, if anybody can tell me, uh, please, it's a million dollar question we'd like to know, but we don't foresee our tax season, we're coming back into the office. And so that starts in January. So that's going to be a real challenge for us to be able to, to push through. And we just finished with 915. And that 915 was not real fun. That was, that was, that was a lot of problems for us. So we, we do see that it's, as it will be a challenge. However, we've done, we've done you know, less with more. So at this point, we think that we're gonna be able to manage it. It's because what we have to do, right? Nobody thought we would be going to a university with a, on a Zoom call, right? But we are, and the kids are managing. I call them kids or young people. Anybody younger than me, I call them my kids. So the kids that we bring in, I'm telling you, they're, they're, they're highly technically trained. They, they grew up with that iPhone in their hand. So they know the modern technology. So it's not really an issue of, you know, understanding how to work remotely. It's more of the culture. How do we get them embraced in our culture moving forward? We, we're working on it and we're doing a lot of things and some things are sticking, some things aren't. And I imagine, you know, Monica, they're doing the same thing as a firm, trying to figure this out. And all in all, I can tell you, it, it's people at this point, we're all very thankful again, and grateful for what we do. We're in the greatest profession in the world. It's the accounting and tax profession. As someone said, look, whether it's black ink or red ink, you still got to count the ink. You still got to get the financials, <laughs> right? Yeah, well said. <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah, Monica, uh, can you please share some insights about Ernst and Young with that respect? Yeah, absolutely. And, and if I go on mute, it's because my fire alarm just has started going off intermittently. <laughs> so go to another panelist, but I'll try to get my words in before it goes back on. So at Ernst and Young, we really look at this about the future of work. And really, what is the future of work going to look like? And one of the things we're really focused on right now is just how do we make sure that when things get to, when things level out and we get to that future of work, that all of the good things that we've tried to do in regards to flexibility and work-life splicing and the different values that have been like the positive impacts of COVID where people, where our employees and our professionals are really trying to make sure that they're setting those appropriate boundaries between work and life, which is very hard, um, but people are trying to do it, that we continue along with that. Um, you know, our, our U.S. chairman has said it's unlikely that we'll reopen offices until early 2021. Um, we are looking not to reopen our offices until we have like at least a 28-day decline in cases. So I think we're saying that because we're in accounting and we can do this, we're just going to do um, double the CDC recommendation. So if CDC is 14, we'll look at 28 days. So we're really trying to figure out, you know, when will we reopen and when we reopen, what will that look like? Um, if we have 600 professionals in South Florida between our offices. Sorry, guys. Yeah, while we have fire alarms going on, uh, we have another CPE question coming, popping up on the screen. And also I encourage our participants to ask questions through the Q&A session since our session is almost towards the end. So we want to have still a couple of questions from the audience. So please type your questions in the, in the Q, using the Q&A button available at the top, at the bottom of the screen. Okay, so I, and, and you Monica, you let me know when the alarm is or still going, <laughs> okay, okay. So, uh, okay, so while we are waiting for Monica to finish answering the, pre the previous question, I, I want to, to ask a question that, will pro that is probably of interest to many students who are graduating or, or will be graduating soon. Do you guys think that the skill set needed uh, to be successful, relevant in the profession, has to change or there are some skills that that will make students more successful in the near future. David, if you don't mind starting with that. Sure, sure. I, I, I definitely think technology skills are the, the future. I don't think that's a requirement 
today. But, you know, to your point, Christina, you know, it's definitely something that will make you more successful, make you more valuable to accounting firms industry, you know, but right now, I don't think that's a, you know, I, I would say that's what we would call a preferred skill, but not a required skill. You know, we, we're, we look mainly, especially, you know, in the tax side of corporate, but just in corporate in general, you know, we look at either accounting firms or other industries for, you know, that they have expertise in, in those areas. You know, those are the two places, the main places we hire. We also hire from the colleges with, you know, with, with interns and, and, and staff and the interns a lot of times will, will, will come on board, but we're typically looking for that expertise. You know, when, when, when you come to a corporation more than a public accounting firm, you know, we're expecting, you know, that you have skills already to do a lot of the jobs as opposed to in public accounting, you know, they're hiring every year, the bottom layer, and you're moving, you're moving up through the, to, through the chain, excuse me, you know, so, you know, so part of it, like I said, I don't, I don't think it has changed yet, but, you know, industry is more of, a, as we get people from places that have these skills, you know, we, we, we look for them. And, you know, we're, we're definitely looking for, you know, the, the technology skills, I would say that we've been, you know, I, I just hired an intern this summer. And, you know, one of the things we were looking for is we're, we're doing a lot more automation and analytic type stuff in, on the tax side. So we were looking for people that had Power BI or Alteryx kind of skills. It wasn't a requirement, but it was definitely something, you know, that a lot of more, you know, established tax people don't necessarily have and a lot of college students have. And it was, you know, it was, it was valuable to us and we ended up, you know, hiring somebody with those skills and it's, you know, been, been helpful. But, you know, if somebody might have been better, we might not have, you know, not hired that person just for that skill. But it's definitely something we're starting to look for. Okay, thank you. And um, Monica, if you don't mind, I will go back to you. <laughs> so if you have something to add on the previous question or you have some yeah. thoughts on this question. Absolutely, and I apologize to all the participants for that. Um, I didn't know they were testing the fire alarm today, but I guess um, but we have to be agile. So on the, on the other question, we were talking about the future of work. I think as auditors um, and even tax providers, we work um, you know, from our office or remotely at our client's office. So for us, not only do we have to have like each accounting firm, you know, EY and others have our procedures and policies in place to have like a full return to work, we're also very um, reliant on what our client's policies are. And, and a lot of companies, you know, auditors or tax providers are still in the contractor or contractor bucket and that's their last phase. So we do have clients that are saying that um, they probably won't invite us back on site until the spring in 2021. Um, but with that being said, we've onboarded, you know, first year audit clients and we've done their audits 100% remotely. And, you know, while it probably wasn't as efficient as we would like it to be at EY, it's been effective. And we've been able to work with lots of different companies, you know, to execute on that. And I'm sure on the tax side, they're seeing the same thing. You know, while we do want to be there face to face and we want to have those one-on-one -on -one and in-person discussions. And, you know, sometimes there's tough discussions and confidential discussions that need to be had in person. A lot of the work can be done remotely and will continue to be. And I think that's something, you know, we can look forward to is just looking for the future of work and how it will be much more interrelated with your life and your personal life. And now, like when, you know, as long as you get your work done, we're never asking anybody, you know, what they're doing. You can free to share you know what you're doing outside of work but we're not evaluating the merits of why people need time off and i think that's very important um in just a whole future forward mentality is that everyone's personal situation is different and your work is going to work with you irrespective of what you want to do outside of work so i think that's um as we return to work will be a, a positive um people will feel more free to take that time off um when they need it but I do see we probably need quite a few more things, at least in Florida, with um, the direction the cases are. And likely at EY, we're probably holding out for the vaccine to fully return to our um, But more to come and, you know, more to see. As it relates to, you know, hiring and, you know, professionals joining the workforce, 
I love that you guys talked about your data, data analytics masters. That's the accounting, finance, and focus on that because that's something you know we're really looking to do. We still primarily hire people that are audit and audit and tax backgrounds, which is really the accounting majors. But we are also hiring you know people in consulting and in technology consulting, so other majors and things of that nature. There's jobs for them. Um, analytics is huge. Um, we're working to do a lot of audit transformation in regards to the use of analytics, and we do use tools like Power BI and Altrix. So understanding those, I think, is um, really great. And as you know, young professionals are thinking of what can I do in my spare time? It's can you get any of those certifications? Um, we're also really looking at like transformative leadership and who's going to be the next leaders in our firm when we hire um, right out of college. We kind of expect people to come with a new attitude about transformation. And as we're transforming our practices and as professionals, I think being you know, agile and resilient is one of the things we start to look for. Some of those skills are learned over time, but I think if you're a young professional and you're about to enter the workforce, you've now ended academia in a time of tremendous uncertainty and you probably have the resilience that companies are looking for. You know, at EY and at other large firms, because it is I'm an apprenticeship model, so many of the skills are learned on the job. So it's really still about coming with, you know, the basics of accounting and then building on that. So to kind of piggyback on what David said, like there is still so much on the job coaching. And, you know, we did have a virtual internship this summer, which was six weeks um, virtual. I know we had a couple of UM participants throughout the U.S. and the Americas. Um, also, you know, we are hiring. We have, you know, staff one starting in October 1st. And we're going to work through onboarding them virtually. Their computers are sent to their house. And. Um, you know, lots of team meetings, but um, we'll work through it. And we think people are showing up very prepared based on the educations they're getting at great schools like the University of Miami. Thank you, Monica. And Sean, do you have anything to add on that point? Yes, yes. You know, it, um, kudos to the University of Miami, because I, I tell you what, anytime we hire um, any of the young people coming out, one, they're ready for that CPA exam. And, they're, and they take it and they pass it. That is such a big hurdle. So, you know, kudos to, to the university because the students come out and they're ready. They, they're tooled up. And as Peter Drucker said, you know, you hire character and you train skill. Well, with Miami, you can get the skill. So really part of, you know, the, of, of hiring into our firm, which has been around in South Florida since 1963, really is a culture. I mean, we're embedded there here and we have a long history with a lot of businesses here. So we really want to make sure that somebody fits into our culture. Now, how do we do that remotely? If we're not going to be able to get it, you can't, you, you, we can't have one of our famous parties where we're, we're having, you know, alcohol and you really get to know somebody, right? So these things are, we're going we're gonna to work them out. We're going to get back to the days of people. And that's what we talk about. We'll, we'll get back to the days of people because in our industry, you really got to like people. And if you don't like people, then maybe we can put you in the back and you can twist the wrenches and that's okay. I mean, everybody has a different personality and that's what we do really well is finding out that personality where we believe that they can help us and where they can thrive. And our mentorship programs will put them in a spot for success. And so the training and collaboration portion that we see um, is very, very important. And you really have to be a team player. And we do these PIs, right? These are um, uh, personal index, I believe is what, they, what they're called. And they're basically telling you if you're gonna fit in to us, right? So you're gonna take this test and you're gonna say, look, this person is not gonna fit into our culture. Now don't get afraid, you know, kids shouldn't be frightened of it because there's a, there's a spot for everyone, right? So we're not gonna tell you, you don't fit in to it because you didn't pass the PI test, but we got to understand where that person is at. And we take a really, really serious role in mentorship. Everyone who comes to us, we want to see them succeed. Their success is our success. We have a lot of good people who come from the University of Miami. Hopefully we can grab some more of those uh, uh, young people coming through. And so what we see is probably one of the primary, and, and just from the tax side, is really we hire ones with uh, masters. You have to have a master's of tax or be into the program or be able to go, get into the program and we'll work with you. If you're good, we'll take you and then you're gonna need to make get your master's of taxation. 
we see that the communication skills, particularly the writing skills, the skills to communicate effectively to clients, to break down very complex laws and put it into layman's terms so they can understand it. That is a skill set that I think is more learned on the job than it is in the classroom. It's just because of that you're not going to be able to, you know, you know, stimulate or emulate those types of conversations. So I do believe that the writing skills and the communication skills are very, very important. Now, the, the uh, technology skills, high-end Excel has always been a mainstay. And speaking of our firm, it's like we hire a lot of people that really are not, not really accountants or part of tax people. We've hired mechanical engineers for the R&D. We've hired software developers to help us on our back office software to integrate our systems into client systems. And we're going to keep seeing that. I mean, we're going to see, you know, this compression of technology very quickly. And what we see is the skill sets of being able to adapt. And so the, you know, the young people coming into a firm, they need to be able to be able to be a, a, adaptable, be able to learn, be able to be collaborative, and then be able to communicate. I think those are probably the, the top things that we look for in a candidate. Thank you, Sean. And thank you, Monica, for answering the question in the, that's the advantage of Zoom. You can answer questions by typing the answers. But uh, yeah, if you, if you don't mind answering that question so yep. everyone else can. Yeah, can absolutely. So while like EY's physical offices are closed, like EY's virtual presence is strong. So we have been executing audits on SEC registrants that are fiscal year end, so 6.30, or even the audits from last year, 100% remotely. And we've done it within the constraints and deadlines of our clients. Um, EY has done a lot of things, probably similar to all other to enable working remote. Um, we gave each employee a stipend to buy additional monitors. We're helping subsidize their internet, internet connectivity and really just working with all of our collaboration tools. So while you know our physical presence, like it, it's, it's just, it's, it's not that it's shut down. Like if I wanted to go to my office, I could. It's just, um, we're in a work from home advisory that is mandatory um, at this point, unless you get special dispensation to go in. But we can do the audits and we can do any tax services remotely or consulting services and we have you know invested in technology and people to ensure that and you know we work closely with our clients to co-develop a timeline to make sure we can um you know execute on our promises to them i know um on one of my clients it was a first year audit it's sec registrant we took over the account um, farm recently and we've done it 100 percent remote <laughs> yeah Apologies about fire alarms, and but it's a good sign, right? So we have another CPE question popping on the screen. Every time we have a fire alarm, there is a CPE question. So please take it, take a couple of seconds to answer the question. And it's already 9.55. Uh, I hope everyone else was having a great time, as great time as I am here. I learned a lot today and I would like to thank all our panelists for sharing these insights with us and and now i have as a professor i have a better understanding of how to how to do teaching what to advise students and in general for the from the research perspective i i think i got a couple of research ideas for the future so i would like to thank you guys for being with us today and uh, if you don't mind, uh, I will uh, now ask uh, Miguel Minuti Meza to, to give a few concluding remarks at the end of our forum. Miguel, are you still there? Yes, I am. Uh, thank you uh, very much to uh, all of you, uh, panelists, great remarks. Uh, I've done some research on going concern. Christina has done research on going concern. Uh, thank you for all of the questions. I just uh, want to uh, remind all uh, that in the chat, there is a link uh, for uh, our development page. Uh, if you uh, feel like giving, uh, we are, we will be happy to receive your donations. And also I remind you of two more things. Connect next Friday, we'll be here, same place, uh, same time. And also, uh, if you uh, cannot attend, there will be a posting of all the webinars uh, for future reference. So uh, thank you very much. And thank you all for joining. Bye. Thank you. Have a great day, guys.
Bye, take care. Stay safe, right? <laughs> yeah. Bye, take care.